Welcome to the video. Today I'm going to talk about an artist I've been following since around 1974, 1975 and he's been recording albums right up until more or less the present day. His catalogue is vast. So what I've been doing in putting this video together is I've been listening to what I think are the top 20 albums and a few others that I wasn't 100% sure of and I've been kind of whittling that down to what I think are the top 10 albums by this particular artist. What I've also been doing is making lots of notes and some of those notes I'm going to be referring to as I do this rundown. Um, so let me start by asking the question, what makes a great songwriter? Now, different people have got different views of what makes a good songwriter. Uh, and here's some of the key questions, I think. How about writing hit songs? Well, today, Peter Hamill is not one of those songwriters, so he doesn't tick that particular box. Um, what about great melodies? Well, yes, but not always. Peter Hamill's very experimental. Some of his stuff is uh, rather difficult. Uh, others are highly melodic. Uh, there's enough of melodic songs to appeal to people who like singer-songwriters peppered throughout his career. Uh, someone who can write more than a few songs. So we don't want uh, you know, a, a comet to burn brightly and then disappear, or a shooting star perhaps. Uh, we want somebody who we can genuinely say is a great songwriter. We want them to be writing songs for an extended period. Maybe a bit like Bob Dylan. Hamill certainly ticks that box and he's probably written hundreds of songs, uh, well over a hundred, uh, possibly 200, 200? I think maybe, maybe, maybe well over 300 have appeared on albums uh, throughout their career. Uh, songs that others sing that other people cover, well, there isn't too many of those. I think that's possibly because of the way that Hamill delivers his songs. It's so distinctive and taking away his voice and leaving the bare bones song, you kind of leave something significant behind. And I think Mark Armand is about the only one I can think of who's covered some of Hamill's songs that really pass muster. And how about writing great songs over several years and not just a few in uh, quick succession? Well, I've already said something about that, haven't I? He's been writing songs for over 50 years. And his songwriting through that period is, in my judgment, is undiminished. So I've had mixed feelings about making the video because it's really been quite hard to select the best, uh, but also because he's such a fringe artist. So those people who know him, know him. So if you know, you know, uh, but he's never really been popular. So I'm kind of thinking that I'm making this video and nobody's going to watch it except a handful of people who are already Peter Hamill fans. Um, but I'm, I'm making this video really for myself to kind of try and kind of chalk the wheel or draw a line in the sand to try and reflect on um, the best part of 50 years of listening to this guy's music. Um, so, um, have you ever heard of the word stentorian? Stentorian means to sing powerfully and loudly and the only time I've ever seen that word used is in reviews of Peter Hamill's albums in the music press. And, but I don't think it does justice to, to his voice, which is a unique instrument, because one of the things that Hamill is able to do, he's able to, to go from the very loud to the whisper in a moment. So you'll often find in his songs, he'll be singing a line of the song and he will start quietly, go loud and go quiet again in the span of a single line. So it's really quite unique and it, it means, I think, to a degree as well, that his music doesn't make for easy listening, even though that some of the stuff is, um, as I've already indicated, very melodic, uh, kind of catchy in some cases, and, and memorable. So, um, right, so... Okay, uh, let me just uh, <laughs> let me just take some more more time with my notes here. Um, yeah, so reviewers often always draw attention to Hamill's astonishing voice, powerful 
um, as any of that you'll hear then fall into a whisper in a moment, as I've already said. Uh, it's an incredible instrument and it's totally unique. Um, yet it remains beautiful and highly listenable, which I've kind of implied. It's further enhanced by his penchant for multi-tracking his vocals to create a choir-like effect. It's like otherworldly feeling in his, in his music. And unlike most rock singers, uh, maybe all rock singers, his diction is normally clear as a bell. So no slurring or rock and roll affectations in his singing. He's, he's got such a unique, uh, a unique voice. So music lovers of a certain vintage may have spotted Hamill as the big cheese and Van de Graaff generator, of course. So I discovered him by buying one of his early albums um, simply because it was on the Charisma label and I was already a Genesis fan. So I thought, well, this guy's probably going to be interesting. And I bought a couple of compilations uh, soon afterwards. Uh, and my first, um, I think my first Hamill stroke Van de Graaff album was in fact a Hamill album. Then I went back to discover Van de Graaff Generator soon afterwards. Um, he not only has written hundreds of songs, as I've suggested, he also wrote all the songs for Van de Graaff Generator, uh, maybe bar one tune, uh, which I think George Martin wrote, theme one, very early on. Um, I think they're still going. Um, they've had, they've been together, broke apart, came back together again, broke apart for a long period, then came back together. Uh, and I know, what I understand anyway, is that Hamill took ill uh, in May this year and he's been rather silent since then, uh, apart from, I believe, he, he shows up on Twitter from time to time. So he's uh, he's probably still in recovery or something like that. So you know, we wish him well, obviously. Um, he's recorded and performed almost constantly, vast catalogue. His solo style started as a mixture of acoustic ballads went more progressive is that the what happened is that the songs he was writing for van der graaff generator spilled over into his solo career and in fact the van der graaff generator musicians often supported him on his solo album so they sound very much like van der graaff generator in places um but then he he he, he then made a conscious decision um maybe about 20 30 years ago that's a long bloody time, isn't it? Where he wanted to be, he wanted to make a solo material very, very distinctive. And he started to play all of the instruments himself. He went for a more bare bones approach in many cases, focusing on piano and acoustic guitar and maybe some keyboard wash in the background on some of his albums. Uh, but we'll go through and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, as I suggest, he's released about 36 studio albums since his first, which is called Fool's Mate in 1971. That's in addition to 13 Van der Graaff Generator albums. That's excluding live albums. Uh, none of the albums can be declared hits, nor do any stand out head and shoulders above the rest to be considered a classic, like say, Close to the Edges in Yes's catalog or Dark Side of the Moon in Floyd's or Selling England by the Pound in Genesis. Uh, so where do you start? So for the purposes of this video, I'm sticking to Hamill's solo album. So I'm going to leave the, my Van de Graaff Generator review for a different time. So beyond the 70s, his style uh, became and has remained much more personal and more sparse. Now that's, there's one caveat on that is that he went through a period where he did albums that were very new wavy. So he, in fact, uh, one of his albums, Nadir's Big Chance, uh, which was referenced by John Lydon famously um, as, a, as an influence. Uh, he, he, uh, the title track in particular is very punky. It sounds very, very punky. So he was already had a bit of a um, yeah, kind of an open mind when it came to making music that was immediate and dissonant and so on um so he, he went through it so he picked up on new wave in the late 1970s and went through the early to the mid 1980s playing a lot of albums that you would class as new wave they stand up today but i think there was something about those albums that or something about him recording those albums that meant the success success didn't really flow to him and I think it's because of his age. He'd been recording music since the very late 1960s. And by the time 
the punk movement came along, he was already probably too old. Um, certainly too old to be a party animal along the likes of uh, the sort of people that music journalists used to hang out with. He's often cited, oh, I, I talked about that, yeah. Uh, so as I already said, I've said he has a heck of a challenge to select the best from such an extensive and varied catalogue. And I think it's in similar fashion to selecting the best of the likes of Johnny Cash, Elvis Costello, Neil Young, Bob Dylan. The best you can hope to do is kind of present some pointers as to where people who maybe bought a compilation or a, a live album uh, of which I say, which I must say also, he's recorded many. Uh, so there's probably a, a, um, about 20 or 25 live CDs out. And I think this is the most recent one. It's not untypical. It's an eight CD box set of live solo performances. Uh, and this one here, which came out just a couple of years before, uh, Piano, Guitar and Vox. Um, this is just a two CD version of a seven CD set. <laughs> So he, he throws everything out into the market. Um, so I think basically it's for anybody who is kind of curious about uh, Peter Hamill, has maybe heard one or two things, um, has maybe have a compilation, as I've suggested, and wants to kind of work out where to go next. Because I think if you're coming in cold to Peter Hamill's music, it's an absolute minefield because there's some stuff that's, uh, utterly fantastic and other stuff that is kind of borderline unlistenable would be overstating it but you get you get my point it's very very varied so rather than attempt to run down from worst to best which was a, it would be an impossible task i'm selecting my top 10 in ascending order so you can take your pick of the more progressive and the more acoustic albums depending on your taste but in all cases i'd say my preferences are at least as much influenced by how well the tone of his vocals have been recorded. Okay, okay, here's number one. Um, the first album I want to select is From the Trees. Uh, this one was released in 2017. Um, I hope you notice here, this one's autographed. Um, I think Peter Hamill has got the best autograph in the business. Um, and I must also add, um, he did release a couple of books in the 70s. This one is a book of lyrics uh, called Killer's Angels Refugees. And I was lucky enough to uh, to meet him after a solo set at Newcastle City Hall. And he signed it for me, which uh, I was thrilled about at the time. Now I've got a book that's rare. It's autographed. But I'm thinking, what's the point in getting 20 quid for it on the market? I might as well hold on to it. Anyway, back to From the Trees. This is a very personal album. Um, with an overall theme of aging and decline. It's got a mix of piano, acoustic guitar, it's kind of electric guitar that's kind of muted, occasional keyboard, and a lot of something's quite like multi-track vocals, as I've already mentioned. And it creates a kind of an ethereal feel. Um, so like I've said, themes of aging, death, reputations so carefully cultivated but now fading into meaningless. Now, as someone who is just about retired, I can uh, I can um, relate to the idea of cultivating your reputation in your professional circles, and then once you begin to step back from the front line of the workspace, um, how little people listen to you anymore. <laughs> so, you you know the reputations that you're so concerned about really really do become kind of meaningless as you as you uh, you move away. Um, being over the hill is another theme, parallel there, of course. Uh, and this is like an album of an artist who's also over the hill and he knows it. So a career approaching his end. So I'm not sure how much more music Peter is going to uh, to produce, but um, I think he's realizing that even though the music is still very, very good, um, it's kind of coming to an end. Um, it's not the greatest album because obviously it's number 10 in my list and there's a sense of overreach here he's kind of overreaching for melody um it's a bit like having a gift of being being able to write melodic songs but that's beginning to desert him uh, but there are good tracks on here uh, most notably the album closer which is called the descent 
uh, but also my unintended milked and torpor. There's a sense of calmness about the whole thing. His vocal dexterity constrained and its sound is uh, reminiscent of his 1991 album called Fire Ships. Um, it's not a comforting listen. His albums never are. Uh, but it feels like an important milestone in his long career. Indeed, one can, can appreciate Hamill's longevity and his ability to maintain maintain quality output throughout it's very creditable of him um, so there you go number 10 in my list is from the trees okay um, number nine is the album this and this was recorded in 1998 so I call this um, kind of a beguiling release it's all soundscapes and subtlety it's highly melodic and highly musical and that's not something you can always say about Hamill some of his stuff is so sparsely recorded um, sparse in its arrangement that you it's very austere and like I say it's not easy listening but this has a lot of music going on around the vocal which is really really enhances it um, so it has wonderfully restrained contribution from Stuart Gordon, the violinist who's played with Hamill for a very, very long time, and saxophonist from Van de Graaff Generator, David Jackson. Now, I don't know what, what went on. Maybe somebody can put something in the comments if you're a big fan. But David Jackson was a mainstay of uh, Van de Graaff Generator for many, many years until about maybe seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. There was a big bust up, a big falling out, and uh, Jackson no longer is involved with Van de Graaff Generator, which is a real shame because his saxophone playing is really unique and brings a real um, texture, um, colour to Hamill's music, whether it's in Van de Graaff or whether it's solo. But, to, but anyway, he appears on this particular album. Um, he also has, um, you know, Hamill plays guitar and keyboards. Is, is that? He's got Manny Elias who plays drums uh, with real inventiveness but restraint. So it's none of this banging stuff. It's all very subtle. Uh, the Ill album kicks off with um, Frozen in Places. Frozen in Place. It's declared as a fragment. It's very short. It's like an ambient. And it, what follows is a, is a track called Unrehearsed, which starts off in a very gentle fashion before some wailing sax and uh, kind of dominant guitar um, comes into the midsection before again it becomes it may, kind of makes its gentle exit uh, the most dynamic song on the album it's tough but it's kind of all also beautiful um, since the kids is a track number four is another reminder of the feeling of loss maybe grief that goes with newly empty nesters so parents who've seen their children leave home very recently for university or for work or to move to a different town um, and he presents these as kind of tortured parents who see this momentous family event as a precursor to their own decline um, to be critical this is the same theme as a track autumn on the over album from 1977 so he does you'll find that he, re, he comes back to these particular themes so he mines a rich seam of discontent perhaps um, always is is next uh, track number eight is has a pulsing rhythm but it's all very very much under control uh, everything here on this album it's worth saying is recorded very very beautifully and if there's anything that comes close to background listening or listening in the car this would be right up there um, anything else to say about this particular album excuse me for referring to my notes here the light oh the final track the light continent it's seemingly about Antarctica and is reminiscent of the track Gaia also from the fire ships album which I meant I've already mentioned but it's about three times as long as Gaia um, it's too energetic to be considered ambient uh, it's more like a piece um, from the, um, I think it's, I think he it was Icelandic uh, composer Johan Johansson. 
who, who, who died uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it's got this album here has got none of the aggression of Hamill's earlier albums of that new wave period I mentioned and it's accessible for those who appreciate it appreciate unidentifiable sounds and a languid pace Hamill's voice is always under control slightly in the distance with the with the room in which the voice is recorded you know you can kind of it's really apparent you can you can hear his recording in a space it's not a really dry recording where his his mouth is right up against the microphone you can kind of hear the room and it, 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 it provides a really really good atmosphere so it's kind of a bit of a late night listen it passes that particular test as well uh number eight mentioned that one the album over from 1977 uh, this is well known as his breakup album although he's got many breakup songs peppered throughout his catalog uh crying wolf starts there you go Crime Wolf starts in a punchy fashion with Guy Evans, the Van de Graaff generator drummer, uh, Nick Potter, ex-bass player in Van de Graaff. Um, you know, really good rhythm section, really kind of pumping it. And uh, nice guitar riff too. In fact, Hamill's guitar playing in this album is at a cut above his normal level of performance. I've seen Hamill several times with Van de Graaff and as a solo artist. And... It's almost like he's he's walking the high wire when he picks up his guitar. I think he's really competent on the on the piano. Um, he's lot, finds lots of variety and pace on the piano, and he's not virtuoso stand virtuoso standard, but he's still very very listenable. But when he picks up the, the guitar, it's jarring. It's often jarring, and and as I say, like walking the tightrope, hanging on by his fingernails. Um, he's it's almost like he struggles to hit, to hit the notes. But to be fair, he's very good with the effects uh, pedals and other bits of kit in his studio. And he's able to get a whole variety of sounds. So he's a lot more expert than I give him credit for. Um, but you, it's not like watching, uh, say, Steve Hackett play where barely a note is out of place. Um, when you hear Hackett play uh, guitar, uh, you would never hear the same guitar uh, solo twice uh, not that there's much in the way of guitar solos kicking around anyway uh, Graham Smith who played with Van de Graaff uh, albeit briefly plays violin and there's a little bit of orchestration that kind of makes this one of the more appealing ones for uh, Peter Hamill newcomers uh, Autumn like <laughs> tells the tale of parents seeing their offspring fly the nest that theme as I mentioned uh, leaving the latter behind to reflect on their dreams unfulfilled. A sadness, but with a twist as the singer wonders how long will it be before those that left will face exactly the same situation with their offspring in the years to come. This kind of feels like a transitional album, a bridge between his more proggy, really experimental stuff in the early to mid-1970s, 77, so just on the verge, and the later stuff when he was doing more uh, genuine solo solo albums, um, but it's it's a great album. It's um, it's a beautifully recorded album as well. Nineteen seventy seven. This is a uh, this is a, a newly remastered one, maybe ten years ago, not two thousand six. Well, not far off twenty years ago, but it sounds absolutely fantastic. Heartily recommended. So that is number eight. Number seven from 1979 is this the first of his new wave period i don't know maybe it's getting close to it ph7 i think it's ph7 i think they call i think it was his not his seventh album but i think actually is it eight, eighth album uh very varied collection definitely new wavy in places it's got a track here on here called handicap and equality which is about the the plight of people who um, have to live with disability and one of the things that I've heard it said is that um, although this is from 1979 he uses language terms that we wouldn't use today in 2022 but there's something about his compassion and directness that allows him to get away with it even in retrospect um, there's no doubt about it. he would never have written this song if he didn't feel 
that empathy and that compassion for the people who were um, were suffering uh, such difficulties. Um, but really, even though it, I'm, I'm describing here and talking about people who are handicapped, disabled, um, he's really addressing it to the rest of us to respect these people as um, normal human beings and why wouldn't we? Um, so he's taken a bit of criticism for that but I think it's a wonderfully memorable uh, track that's full of empathy and compassion. Um, he's He's really, I mean, just in the general, I think he's really motoring here. This is a really, really good album. The, the tracks tend to be shorter than the earlier ones and to the point with subject matter that really resonates. Uh, he plays most of it in himself, but David Jackson on sax uh, comes along and adds kind of a bit more of a pleasing sonic palette, uh, which really helps. And he's done that throughout Hamill's career as well, as I've already said. Um, I could have chosen other albums, Sitting Targets or Patience from this period, but I think this is one is the standout. Um, there's absolutely no hiding his sincerity and his kind of, as I say, his directness and his compassion. Um, I hope that's not a contradiction. Um, Time for a Change, which you can't see there. Yeah, as the back cover, for those of you who have, are not familiar with it, um, there's a time for a change. Is, it's very quietly dramatic, and he continued or continues to play that in his solo shows all those years later. So, 1979, page seven, number seven. Number six in my favorites is one of his more recent albums from 2009 called Thin Air. Now, Thin Air, I think this is one of his best sounding albums. Uh, it's, it provides a superb balance between that sort of uh, restrained instrumentation that are the, the keyboard washes and so on and so forth and his voice. And he's got a lot of low register uh, rumbling going on uh, in the background, which really is quite pleasing. It, it, it makes it sound really quite contemporary. Um, Obviously, it consists of the usual themes of aging and our eventual demise. Uh, as usual, of course, as well, it's intimate and it's emotional, but it's also clear-headed. He's got a song in here, the second one, called Your Face on the Street, which he wrote about uh, an abducted young woman uh, who was abducted in Bath and was eventually um, murdered. And, um, you know, it really pulls at the heartstrings. Um, he talks like, as, 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 maybe it's not him, but it's somebody else walking, walking down the street and seeing this young woman on a fairly regular basis and kind of as if he and she were on nodding terms or even said hello from time to time. And then she's no longer there and it's it's really affecting um it's a wonderful wonderful uh song um but at the same time he's really uh anger yeah he's got lots of anger towards the um the perpetrator uh undone which is the third track of last is uh melodic it's delightful with a hint of electric guitar solo between the piano accompaniment that's kind of easy for the newcomers to appreciate and stumbled which is the third track from the beginning, believe it or not, despite what I've said about his guitar playing, has an electric guitar under the acoustic guitar that strums, that's very reminiscent of Robert Fripp, <laughs> who he really is a virtuoso. But hey ho, that's Thin Air from 2009. So we've got to the top five in my list here. And number five from 1974 is In Camera my first Peter Hamill album. Uh, no doubt I bought it cheap in JJ Windows in Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, I would imagine this didn't sell very well and so it ended up in the uh, in the cheap bins and because it was on Charisma, as I've said, that's, what, that's why I picked it up. So you see the Charisma label logo on the top corner there. Um, it's a mixed bag. Um, 
Side one is incredibly strong with Ferret and Featherbird. No more the Submariner. Uh, again, Faint Heart and the Sermon. Great song titles. Um, he uses a lot of synthesizer on this album. It's kind of it's the first time synthesizer comes to the fore, but his voice is still in uh, in dominant. Um, side two, in my judgment, is less <coughs> less satisfying. It has um, uh, the comet, the course, and the tail, which is brilliant. But then it's got Gog and then Magog. Um, and that's when uh, he's really become, I mean, when his first album, um, Fool's Mate, has acoustic ballads on it. Um, this is real electronic uh, experimentation here. Um, I've said here, and I, I was listening to it just the other day, and I said, Gog is, uh, or is it Magog? I don't, it's definitely, well, one of those two tracks, I think it's Magog, is definitely influenced by Tangerine Dream's uh, Phaedra album. Uh, especially the opening but you know it is got a special place in my heart because it was my first one um, it's definitely more of a solo album than its predecessor so this is a, I think the first his prede the predecessor was the silent corner and the empty stage um, which sounds quite a bit like a van der Graaf generator album this is a much more solo affair and really has that very very different sound um, it's an album that I think it's hard to love that with a sound that's dry and uncompromising. Um, that it's unbalanced between side one and side two also makes it, or if it was listening on CD, it would kind of fade out into the less satisfying uh, side two components. Um, it, I find it less than totally satisfying, but as I've said, it's the first one I bought. And side one is brilliant, and the comment, the course of tail is good. Uh, it's worth adding that the latest reissue on CD um, contains three bonus tracks uh, in the familiar Hamill plus piano configuration. Uh, I think you recorded them on uh, John Peel for John Peel, and they're absolutely outstanding versions. So yeah, great album. Um, like I say, less than totally satisfying, but hey ho, I put it at number five. Number four from 1986 and close as this. Now, I had this album in my collection, 1986, I said. I have album in my collection for 86. I can tell you for 20 years and I thought it was mediocre and uninteresting. But then um, I listened to a particular track and it made sense to me for the first time. I'll talk about that in a second. This is a kind of a brave album, but it could have been braver. And what I mean by that, it's mostly a quiet acoustic piano, a um, little bit of electronic keyboards here and there, but not much. It's the sparest of, accompany of accompaniment. Um, and it's kind of bold, but he's got two tracks on it. Uh, one is called Silver and the other one is called confidence which sound just too aggressive for the mood created in this album and maybe they would be better with a band um maybe he did play it with a band on some occasions i can't i don't know i never see him see him play i can't remember if he if i saw him play those those particular tracks um but it it, it kind of makes the album ever so slightly disjointed but that dominant late night feel that um really uh you know kind of still gets through um so it's that kind of acoustic album uh, in the main. It really, really gets through. Um, too many of my yesterdays, um, Faith and Beside the One You Love are all favourites. I mean, intelligent lyrics that lay out, you know, real life experience um, in relationships. Um, where he's maybe lamenting on a relationship that has been around for a long time, but it's going nowhere or maybe to the exit door. Um, or even, you know, to Beside the One You Love, which um, is uh, kind of the opposite, where he's kind of acknowledging that he is absolutely with his soulmate and, uh, you know, the pleasure of sleeping next to somebody who you are so incredibly close to. Uh, very, very powerful. Uh, very powerful indeed. Um, but the last track, um, Sleep Now, is the one that kind of is the most moving, um, misty-eyed. It describes 
a father looking into the cot of his young baby daughter or daughters whispering, whispering sleep now and as he quietly sings about his hopes and expectations for their life to come um, you know it's really really beautiful as a declaration of love for his daughters it's just incredible um, and so the, the whole album you know maybe short and sparse sounding especially if you were to program it so you didn't hear uh, silver and confidence um, but it's very moving as an album and it's all about that last track so 20 years having this album having then having daughters of my own um, completely made sense to me finally a uh, fantastic album so that's number four top three number three is roaring 40s this was released where are we 1994 so you got nick potter from van der graaf david jackson on here uh, and this is kind of creating the nearest thing to a van der graaf band sound that he ever did in his solo albums even though this is 1994 um there's long tracks there's uh eight minutes uh, is it in the eight minutes? Yeah, eight minutes and thirty. Uh, the gift of fire, talk turkey, um, and a headlong stretch, which is nineteen minutes. They're both absolutely fantastic. Could easily sit alongside other classics by Van der Graaf. And uh, the sound of David Jackson's saxophone is strong in both of these uh, these numbers. It's another beautifully recorded album. It's full of clarity. You can hear everything about his uh, his vocals. Uh, you, you know, you get lyric sheets, but you know you almost don't need them uh it's got bags of clarity and dynamic range so it's neither the calm of hamill at the piano nor the new wave influenced stuff that he was putting out in the early 1980s instead we have the perfect marriage between sensitivity and dynamism um a headlong stretch the long track 19 minutes long i think possibly the longest solo solo track he ever did um, it appears to be uh, as a but I thought about this and I thought it, it's it kind of it's a he taught it's I think it's about post event rationalization what do I mean by that it's about the sense that we pretend that we're in control of our lives sketching plans for the next hour day month you know year um, yet we only make sense of our lives in retrospect so in a way we self justify the decisions we've already made um, uh, rather than genuinely forecast or plan for what actually happens so we make sense of our lives in reverse um, so I've said here in my notes the message is that we delude ourselves over how we live deterministically or in control and it's more realistic to be less precise about our ambitions and live more in the moment um, you know it starts really interestingly those of you who like van der graaf generator and if you've got this far in the video you're obviously a fan um, there's the saxophone honks um, that's like the foghorn in the van der graaf track a plague of lighthouse keepers um, jackson reprises that here in the opening of uh, this big long track it really does make you smile uh, and it continues with a whole load of tempo changes just like lighthouse keepers uh, and it's got a real forward momentum about it, it really drags you in um, it's easily the best side long tune he's done uh, since lighthouse keepers and it, it kind of as a calm ending um, your tall ship closes the album again a beautifully melodic track a clo great closer wonderful right down to the last two so number two on my list is probably the album that I would go for on vinyl the moment it was released. Unfortunately, we've only got the CD version and it's 1991's Fire Ships. This is the most calm sounding album that Peter Hamill has ever put out. Uh, it's probably the most accessible of all of his albums to the newcomer. So this is one that I would recommend for people who are not that sure about him, want to go one step beyond compilations. 
fire ships 1991 the whole sound is like a wash with um sort of keyboard effects and uh low bass tone so it's kind of it's got this rumbling low sound going through it but loads of clarity too um It's co-produced by um, David Lord, who also provides some keyboards too, uh, and orchestration. And I think it's his uh, best sounding album. I've often felt that the more recent um, Hamill albums just haven't sounded as well recorded as um, as this particular David Lord uh, produced one was. Um, Op uh, I Will Find You uh, opens the album um, so it suggests like a play for a relationship partner who is moving on but Hamill wants uh, them to know that he's um, he'll keep an eye out for them and if need be he'll be there to help um, his best best girl uh, for those of us who are driving GTIs uh, in the 1980s um, it's 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 kind of amusing it's that you've got this aging like kind of imaginous middle-aged playboy type with his gti cabriolet <coughs> where he's got this young uh woman with flowing locks in the passenger seat and um it's all about uh the message to her being to be on her guard because unless um, in fact, he's only she's only his best girl as long as she keeps her looks and so on. So the idea is that uh, if uh, if she's not looking out for herself, there's a good uh, a good chance that she'll end up um, being discarded for a younger model. A bit like uh, when you trade in a motor car. Um, none of the remaining tracks uh, on this album um, make regular appearances on his set list, but it, it the whole thing kind of flows wonderfully for me. And uh, the the final track, I mean, it's, they're all good, but the final track, Gaia, is kind of a, a semi-ambient um, uh, song about uh, kind of, uh, you know, environmentalism, protecting the planet and so on and so forth. So, yeah, absolutely fabulous album. Number two, so the best Peter Hamill album, in my judgment, is... From 1974, the silent corner and the empty stage. Here's the gate floats, golf, uh, gate folds sleeve. Uh, the title is on the reverse, and it is an astonishing piece of work. It's epic. Uh, it comes with an inner with the lyrics on um, in Hamill's presumed Hamill's handwriting. Um, lots of words on this album uh it sounds truly truly epic it could have or should have been a van der graaf generator album um had they not been forced to break up i think they got their kit all their equipment nicked when they were on tour in italy and uh, they lost loads of money as well as the hardware so uh they, they they gave up um it's dense it's rich in musical and lyrical ideas and really repairs dedicated listening um although um i recently gave a, a cd copy to a friend of mine who's uh, who's kind of i thought would like it to describe it as horribly depressing <laughs> which made me chuckle um but there you go um i think it's an absolutely fantastic album um all the van der graaf players of the time appear here uh, and 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 sonically it sounds like a, a van der graaf album um even though that it's got Hamill's more personal and psychologically inclined lyrics, um, a lot of the stuff that he writes uh, uh, for Van der Graaf Generator have got broader concerns like science, the planet, and so on. Um, but here he's uh, he is talking about the personal, so it's great. Uh, modern is the first track he plays that to the present day it opens with a great honking um saxophone to the fore and he sings in that famous stentorian fashion a very powerful singing uh wilhelmina is apparently a love song uh, a love song a little uh, a song for guy evans uh, a newborn uh i think hamill had his daughters uh, sometime later 
Um, but really, it's a, it's it covers the same territory as Sleep Now on as cl and closes this. Uh, it's all about all hope and optimism of the future for the young child, um, kind of anticipating how the innocent is going to grow up and experience the life for themselves um, as independent adults. Um, the lie is dramatic with a startling line which says genuflection, erection in church and, you know, the full range of his voice is here. Uh, Forsaken Gardens is, is, is wonderful. It's kind of, kind of a, an e easy sort of track, uh, maybe one paced, but all about um, um, kind of living for... Um, Kind of living for the moment, um, and 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 also kind of looking after your your garden, um, uh, your relationships, and uh, and everything else for that matter. Um, side two opens with a track called Red Shift, which has got uh, the Californian band Spirits, Randy California, playing what I think Hamill described as like pulsating guitar, and it's like this frip sound again that uh, goes all the way through the track. Um, Rubicon is all calm before a louse is not a home. Um, come at over 12 minutes, close of the album. Um, it's like, it's truly epic. Um, it's dynamic, it's multi-paced, it's intense, brilliant lyrics, and a climax that's absolutely thrilling. It's possibly as great a song, uh, although it's got lots of competition. Um, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, so that's um, my um, top 10 Peter Hamill albums. This is more difficult than Fire Ships, but um, if you've got an interest in, you know, early 70s progressive rock, uh, you like the sound of the sax, you, uh, you also like Hamill's vocals and his um, intelligent uh, lyrics, it's all here. It's absolutely all here. Absolutely fantastic album. Now, along the way, as I mentioned right at the very beginning, he's done quite a lot of um, live albums as well. Um, they can be a bit hit and miss because not only is his guitar playing a little bit hit and miss when you see him live, his vocals don't have the control that they have on the studio albums. And it can come across as a little bit ragged. Um, so it's kind of hard to find... Uh, a live album that really does the trick. Um, let me see if I can find one that I think is particularly good. Yeah, here it is. Here it is. This is the album that I think is fantastic. Typical. Two CD. Uh, might be a little bit tricky to get a hold of, but I'm sure eBay uh, would have versions of it um, if you're not able to get it on something like Amazon or something or in the shops. Um, it's exquisitely recorded. Uh, there's loads of atmosphere here. It's recorded in Europe. Um, the track six on side two is a version of a song called, I think it's from uh, his album called Out of Water. The studio version is kind of really mediocre in my judgment. But the track is called A Way Out. And I don't know whether this is true or not, but it's been reported over the years that he, he was, he wrote it, um, because um, his brother committed suicide. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, so do your own research. But if you can say it's a, it's, um, a story of um, the despair and the detachment that someone who's having a bad time can experience, how disconnected they can become from friends and family, um, uh, up to the point where they feel there's no hope and it's it, there's no no point in carrying on and uh he kind of ends the song where he says uh, i wish i uh, said i love you and uh, but the great thing about that track is not just it's a fascinating subject matter uh an important subject matter is his use of silence um the the pace is glacial um but you can hear a pin drop in the audience. It's it's just incredible. It's incredible. So typical is the album I would go for for a live album. Um, and um, I guess that's probably where I want to finish. Um, 
if you got this far, <laughs> well done. Uh, apologies for uh, referring to the notes, um, but it's really how how do you go through thirty six solo album, uh, studio albums and then another dozen live albums without the help of uh, some notes? I don't know. I've wanted to make this video for a, a long while. I've wanted to have a, a a good thorough reassessment of Peter Hamill's catalogue. I think he's a fantastic artist, a brilliant songwriter. Um, who, if you listen to his music, um, you 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 end up listening to an album um, a little wiser, maybe a little bit more intelligent than you were at the beginning. Um, and he's had that effect, I think, on a lot of people. Uh, he's definitely worthy of serious respect. And if you are curious about getting into um, someone in the singer-songwriter space, but is has a unique and distinctive sound that's that's a bit different then I'd absolutely encourage you to uh, to give Peter Hamill a good go um, anyway so that's it um, I'll probably not listen to Peter Hamill for a little while now after having an intensive couple of weeks um, but uh, in the meantime I'll be on to something else uh, uh, shortly but um, in the meantime just yeah thanks for watching if you got this far fantastic um, and leave a comment let me know what you think about Peter Hamill and how I've got the top 10 all wrong <laughs> but yeah you're anyway thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video cheers